so uh, last time we talked about the uh, technique uh, we use to image uh, flow profiles. And today I'll talk uh, about uh, the actual hydrodynamic electron flow experiments uh, in, in graphene. So again, this is experimental work done with uh, Liorella, Asaf Rosen, Debar Duda, and Shaka Alani. Um, with uh, the great graphene devices made by uh, John, David, Moshe, and uh, Andre Geim. And then uh, theory from uh, Thomas Gafidi from Berkeley, and then Tobias, Raquel, and Adi from uh, here at Weizmann. OK, so I want to, uh, before jumping in, I want to just review uh, what, uh, what we discussed uh, last time. So we used this uh, short segment of a nanotube uh, that's on the end of a cantilever as the scanning SET, which is this uh, very sensitive detector of, uh, of voltages. Uh, we use this to do things like image the voltage drop in a ballistic channel uh, by a, in the uh, limit where we can apply a really small bias. Um, and then by applying a perpendicular magnetic field, uh, we can also image the local hall voltage and relate this to the current. So this is a plot of the, of the black lines are the current streamlines through through some channel, uh, and that's superimposed on the uh, equipotential contours uh, here in, in color. OK, so um, we want to get a bit more into uh, this uh, trick of applying this perpendicular magnetic field to use the hull voltage to uh, infer the current distribution. In the uh, diffusive limit, this uh, works exactly. And in the, uh, in the hydrodynamic limit, it, it also works again. But uh, as, I, as I mentioned uh, before, there can be a, an issue in the ballistic limit. Because uh, you can imagine that uh, as an electron moves through the device, it uh, is uh, going to be strongly influenced by what happened at some other point far away. For example, in the bulk, it uh, still knows about the walls uh, very strongly. right? So. Um, so, so in the experiment, we uh, we we can see this uh, rotation of the uh, of the uh, hull voltage, or rather the uh, rotation of the equipotential contours in real space. So we image the uh, the hull voltage. Uh, take the difference between these two. Uh, we call this the stream function uh, when it's normalized by the uh, hull resistivity. So again, in the diffusive limit, this is uh, exactly the streamlines, uh, and then you can relate this to the current density here. Um, OK, but um, again, just to uh, really uh, emphasize this point, we're really imaging the hull voltage, right? Not, uh, not the current. So uh, keep this in mind for the entire talk. And, and there's, uh, there, there's going to be uh, important limits where this hull voltage will converge to the, to the current, but in general, uh, no. Uh, I actually, I should say, but it turns out that uh, this is actually uh, not, uh, not a problem. It's actually really helpful, because it turns out that this, uh, this uh, hull voltage, or rather the uh, derivative of the hull voltage uh, in this uh, direction, uh, so we call this uh, EY, the Y component of the, the hull field, is going to be the, uh, the key element that we use to distinguish hydrodynamic from ballistic flow. Um, so we'll see uh, exactly what, uh, what I mean by this. OK, so these experiments are done in uh, a series of uh, graphene channels that look like this. So this is an optical image again, where you have uh, source and drain contacts in gold. Then the channels are defined. So the graphene is everywhere in this uh, gray color. Then these uh, blue lines are etches through the graphene. So there's no graphene where the, the blue is. And so then you can define uh, channels. You can also imagine putting you know, little breaks in to look at other kinds of flow with uh, you know, even like we have a wing here, uh, these kind of more exotic things. But uh, none of that's relevant for this talk. We're just going to be looking you know, away from these kind of things in the middle of some channel. This isn't the only uh, set of devices. Uh, I want to stress we have uh, many different uh, samples as well. And we see consistent phenomena across a, a variety of channels. So it's not, it's not uh, the results I, I'm showing aren't limited to you know, one channel that has some weird feature in it. And you can maybe say, wait a minute, this is all uh, some artifact due to that. This is uh, not the case here. OK, uh, so let's uh, think a bit uh, about uh, what we can expect uh, in terms of uh, how electrons are going to scatter off of uh, impurities, phonons, or each other, and uh, what, what regime we can, we, we can hope to be in. So in a typical material, uh, if we, uh, we have some distribution of impurities in, in the channel, uh, and uh, at low temperature, the uh, resistivity can be limited by the, by the collisions with these impurities. As you increase temperature, you hope to decrease the uh, LEE, the electron-electron scattering length, uh, as uh, 1 over t squared. Um, 
but uh, still, you know, you're probably going to be limited uh, by uh, impurity still, and then you get uh, hot enough, then phonons uh, take over, and then so this uh, seems hopeless. So the, the nice thing is with these uh, newer materials, not necessarily newer, right? This is, you know, in certain situations with high mobility gallium arsenide devices, uh, you can also do these kind of things. But uh, for graphene anyway, this also uh, scales uh, favorably in the sense that you can make it super clean at low temperatures where now the relevant length scale is no longer the, uh, the uh, impurities. So these are now hopefully out of the problem completely. And now we just have to contend with uh, basically uh, the, the phonon contribution at higher temperatures. So hopefully we can be in some uh, regime where uh, LEE is uh, going to be smaller than both the width of the channel and the, uh, the phonon uh, mean free path. But we'll see, as, as best we can do is probably to have all of these length scales about on the same, uh, the same scale, right? We're never going to be in this super hydrodynamic regime where LEE is uh, orders of magnitude smaller than anything else. Um, and uh, the challenge is then going to be to distinguish ballistic flow from hydrodynamic flow, uh, which uh, turns out is, is not so straightforward, I think, uh, unless you think carefully about uh, how the, this quantity EY relates to, the, relates to the current profile, the underlying current profile. Uh, okay, so uh, just a bit of notation here. Uh, many people call this LEE, but uh, other people call this LMC, so for the rest of the talk I'll call this uh, LMC, which is you know, momentum conserving uh, collision length. The impurities and phonons I'll group together as LMR, the momentum relaxing uh, length. So just uh, keep that in mind. All right, uh, so I'll, I'll discuss sort of the, the uh, roadmap we'll take uh, to, to get to the, the final result or the, the final conclusion that uh, we indeed see uh, hydrodynamic uh, flow profiles. Uh, the, uh, the route is not uh, entirely straightforward, so it's useful to have some kind of uh, map or timeline to keep in mind uh, the different logical steps we'll, we'll take. So uh, what's going to be uh, important at first is to really understand the, uh, the basic properties of this channel. And by that I mean uh, the, uh, the mean free path, this L uh, LMR, and also the role of the, the walls, right? And how you can distinguish the bulk from the walls and uh, th this, uh, this sort of thing. Uh, then we want to more carefully understand uh, the nature of these uh, ballistic profiles uh, and really how, uh, what's the difference between EY what's the, and, and JX, uh, to what extent uh, can you expect these things to, to be the same, or uh, which one tells you more about uh, the, what's really going on in terms of the flow. Uh, then we're going to heat the, uh, so, so this is all ballistic stuff, right? And then we're going to heat the sample uh, above 4 Kelvin, which is the lowest temperature of these measurements. Uh, but we're going to do this in a way where we, we are, are able to uh, tune the, uh, the role of, of impurities uh, such that uh, the momentum relaxing mean free path is basically the same at low temperature as it is at high temperature. So at uh, low temperature, it's going to be limited by uh, whatever residual impurities are, are in the sample. And uh, as you heat, phonons will take over. So then we we tune the density to go basically to higher density such that the momentum relaxing, uh, the contribution to the momentum relaxing uh, mean free path due to impurities is less and the uh, phonon contribution is greater, right? So, so this is, uh, you know, this, this allows you to compare two profiles directly without having to go through some uh, model in between, right? So you can see really visually very strongly that uh, these two things, uh, it basically just removes a bunch of uncertainty as to how to, to compare the, uh, the profiles. And then finally, we'll uh, discuss uh, to what extent we've really imaged these hydrodynamic profiles and what, uh, you know, to what extent you should trust our measurements. Uh, hope, I hope to convince you that uh, we're, we were pretty thorough in, in trying to find uh, alternative explanations or, or rather uh, controlling for competing effects that, uh, you know, even if we misunderstand some of the parameters in our system, the uh, conclusions are pretty robust uh, and, and proceed, uh, or persist for a, a wide range of uh, experimental parameters. Okay, so let's start with uh, characterizing the, the graphene channels. So let's just take a, a random channel. So uh, we do this basic characterization for all of the channels. So I'll discuss uh, data from a couple of different ones, but they're, you know, this is uh, all standard uh, for us now, and the, uh, the conclusions are, are consistent amongst uh, channels. So, uh, so we have uh, some channel here of width uh, 11 microns, and now we're going to scan the SET uh, along uh, the middle here and measure uh, 
the uh, effective row XX of the channel, right? So even though there's no other contacts, again, because the SET can measure the voltage everywhere in space, uh, you can do this kind of measurement without the, uh, the influence of uh, external contacts. Okay, and then by measuring the, the voltage drop along this line, you can very uh, simply get uh, row XX. Uh, and then we're going to do this in, uh, in magnetic field as well, which is going to be uh, super important for disentangling the contribution of the bulk from the walls and then also understanding exactly what's going on with the walls themselves. Uh, but the, uh, the way to think about uh, B here, we're going to be, the, the magnetic field, we're very far away from the quantum Hall regime, uh, but the magnetic field, of course, is going to cause, uh, create cyclotron orbits uh, inside the material, and we want to compare this, uh, these cyclotron uh, orbits, uh, the, the radius of them, to the width of the channel. So I'll be plotting things typically in units of uh, W over RC, where RC is a cyclotron radius, but this is just uh, linearly proportional to B. So uh, low W over RC is low B, et cetera. So uh, just so you know how to convert it. Uh, uh, okay, so we're going to get two things from, the, from these uh, measurements. Uh, one is the momentum relaxing mean free path, uh, which you'll see how we use the magneto resistance uh, data to, uh, to define it uh, in this way. And the second is uh, a quantity I'll call P, which is the specularity of the walls. So uh, when P is zero, the walls are f fully diffusive. When P is one, uh, you have uh, fully specular deflection. Uh, this is, uh, of course, not a complete description. Uh, you can ask uh, for a uh, given amount of specularity, what's the actual distribution of the electrons uh, going off, uh, uh, coming off of the wall? This is actually important as well, but uh, I'll discuss later sort of the, the minimum set of assumptions that seem physically reasonable uh, that we can, uh, we can uh, tack on to the, this coefficient here. Uh, okay, so let's start with, uh, with the magneto resistance. Uh, so I guess uh, Andy McKenzie will probably talk about similar uh, sort of line shapes, which you can see in uh, this paper here. But uh, this is uh, magneto resistance from, from this 11 micron channel. Um, and you see uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the shape of this looks uh, really identical to this uh, Gurji effect plot that uh, Lawrence Mollenkamp showed. Uh, showed uh, yesterday and the, and the day before. Um, you know, this uh, double peak structure, it's uh, ex exactly the same physics going on. Uh, so it's, uh, it's nice to keep this analogy in mind. If you remember from Lawrence's talk, uh, what was going on between the, the competition of uh, the electron-electron interactions causing uh, electrons to collide with the walls, uh, causing uh, changes in resistance, uh, and that's going to be the same thing here, but instead of electron-electron interactions uh, tuning this change in resistance, it's going to be the magnetic field. Okay, so you can imagine uh, as a function of W over RC, there are different uh, ranges, or, or rather different uh, sets of trajectories the electrons are going to take. So let's, uh, let's look around W over RC equals zero, you have these uh, straight line uh, trajectories that go, that go unperturbed through the sample, but if, we're, if we have diffusive walls, so again, we're going to assume now we have diffusive walls, although it's not really an assumption. As, as you'll see uh, after I, I, I explain this, you'll see that in order to get this shape at all, you have to have uh, diffusive walls. So if you have a completely smooth uh, specular channel, this, uh, this physics is not visible at all. Uh, it's completely uh, due to the, the, uh, the resistance of the walls. So, so we're going to assume in this cartoon that there's no other scattering other than, uh, other than at the walls, and the walls are going to randomize the momentum. Okay, so at, uh, at B equals zero, right, again, you have these straight line trajectories, but some coming at some other angle can hit the wall and then bounce uh, either through, or I should have probably drawn it bouncing back out uh, the other way to increase the resistance. But um, then as you uh, increase the magnetic field, now the, uh, the magnetic field is going to uh, curve the electron trajectories, so things that were straight line that weren't hitting the walls are now going to uh, hit the walls more frequently, and then uh, this can cause a backscattering out of the channel. This gives you an increase in resistance. Um, however, you can guess uh, what, you know, at some point this is going to go away, right? So at W over RC equals 2, for example, you have uh, a closed orbit that fits within the width of the channel. So now it doesn't matter, uh, above, uh, above these fields, it doesn't matter that you scatter uh, along the walls like this. 
they, uh, an electron that scatters on this wall can't connect back to this wall, right? So, uh, so that's why the magneto resistance goes down, because now scattering on the walls uh, like this won't help you uh, go uh, out of the channel. Instead, you'll keep going on. And then you have these uh, skipping orbits along the edge uh, for uh, higher magnetic fields, uh, where you have, and you have these uh, states in the, in the bulk that don't do much uh, other than go around in circles. Uh, of course, at higher magnetic fields, you get quantum hole physics. But again, this is uh, just completely semi-classical, uh, nothing to do with that. Uh, and the, again, because uh, the picture isn't really changing much here anymore, the magneto resistance is pretty featureless above, above W of RC equals 2. OK, so let's, uh, let's think about uh, how we can use that to measure the uh, real mean free path. Uh, yeah. I mean, ideally, uh, it would just be constant uh, with magnetic field, right? In a, this in this cartoon, uh, there would be no ma uh, change in magnetic mean no, magneto yeah. resistance. Yeah. You should see more, more, at more scattering at higher right? fields. Sorry. Right. At higher fields, you should see more resonances where where two of these guys fit in there and whatever. Um, I'm not sure. In this uh, cartoon, it makes sense to have higher resonances, right? Uh, um, there's no other scattering uh, in, in this model. I mean, this is really just a cartoon to get intuition, right? But in this picture, the only scattering is happening at the walls, right? So it yeah, does. Uh, yeah, the case I understand, but if you do have scattering, let's say uh, uh, disorder of scattering in, in the bulk, right? So the increase in the magnetic field would become more and more important. Yes, and you know this is you know this is the actual data. You see, there's some uh, yeah. there's some upturn, right? But Yeah. <coughs> when you go from ballistic to the the classic one, when uh, this fracture should be allowed. Yes, uh, in Drew transport, uh, rho yeah. 6 doesn't depend on D, right? Uh, yeah. 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 Before uh, quantum, uh, quantum work kicks in. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's, there's not, no other way to randomize the momentum here than uh, hitting the wall, right? So, yeah, any, you know, the, the fact that these are getting smaller and smaller, it's. Uh, it, it's not has no influence, but again, of course, you have real impurities, and you can imagine getting other geometric resonances or something. Although, if it's a lar long enough channel, you would guess that these things kind of average out, and you maybe have some background above the the minimum, but no strong features. But uh, but uh, okay, so so we see that uh, this region here uh, for W over C less than two is really sensitive to the walls, right? The uh, this is where uh, you have uh, a lot, uh, a fundamental change in uh, the the electron uh, trajectories. Um, uh, whereas uh, out here, you're pretty insensitive to the to the walls, right? And it's a bit counterintuitive in the sense that what do you mean? It seems like most of the current is bouncing along these skipping orbits going through, but but the point is that uh, these guys are sort of a fixed contribution. And uh, actually, if you look at what's really going on, which I'll maybe touch on uh, a bit later, that the current, the current actually isn't being carried by the, uh, the skipping orbits on the, the walls. Uh, the current actually has uh, quite a large uh, distribution in the, in the center of the channel, which is counterintuitive. Um, but, but anyway, we're going to use the fact that the magneto resistance, at least in this regime, is pretty insensitive to the walls. So you know, this, is, this is all. Uh, an estimate for uh, LMR. Uh, um, you, you basically, if you choose some random value in here, it's definitely going to be dominated by, uh, not necessarily dominated by, but strongly influenced by uh, the walls. Uh, so if you just give me some number of uh, LMR without telling me where you measured this in a magnetic field, I'm not going to know how to, how to interpret it, right? Uh, is that really representative of uh, what's going on in the bulk, or is this uh, representative of the bulk plus the walls, et cetera, right? So, so uh, we, we pick some value here. We sort of uh, fairly arbitrarily, but uh, just because it's far away from 2, choose W over RC uh, greater than 4. OK, and this is where we uh, apply this formula now. So typically, people uh, do this kind of analysis, but at, uh, at 0, right? And I'm, I'm saying that this isn't necessarily telling you much in this, uh, in this kind of uh, device, because, because the contribution from the walls can't be ignored. OK, so we can uh, apply this analysis at uh, W over RC greater than 4. Uh, so this curve here is the one I just showed. This is at uh, high density. And then we can uh, do this for decreasing densities. And uh, 
get the uh, the um, LMR uh, as a function of, of density. So it has this uh, characteristic line shape, and again, this is all at uh, 4 Kelvin. We can do this at uh, any temperature, of course, and uh, that's what uh, I'll show later when we heat. We also uh, measure the same kind of curve, but it'll have a, a different uh, shape where you'll see that it'll actually become saturated at some density at high temperature because, the, uh, because of the phonons, right? So, so, so you do see a second peak. So this is yeah, and this and yeah, and that's because uh, yeah, this is uh, a short channel. <laughs> there's Lawrence also. So. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a a short channel. There's uh, you know, it's this is this this uh, device gave us a very nice looking picture, but uh, yeah, yeah, in long channels you don't uh, see. Yeah, okay, so. Um, all right, so now, uh, so now we have one very important uh, number for the, uh, for the characterizing the, uh, the... But you said the manipulative regime, which is evolution between a channel. So the LMR you extract from, say, the red curve there, mm -hmm. is that not really just look at your channel size? This? Uh, yeah, in the logistic regime, when you have very strong scattering in your channel. No, so that's the point is that if you go to large enough magnetic field, you're, uh, you're insensitive to, the, uh, to, to the, this effect of uh, bouncing between impurities in the bulk and, and the walls, right? Then it's sort of diffusion of carriers in the bulk that, uh, yeah, so that, that's the, the, the trick to get, a, get, a, get rid of the, uh, this issue with not really knowing uh, what you're measuring, right? So I just want to, yeah, to, to sum up that this, uh, this aspect, basically, uh, you have some channel like this, you need to uh, think about how to extract the, the uh, momentum relaxing mean free path. This tells you that you should go to some uh, non-zero magnetic field in order to reduce the, uh, the influence of the, yes? So the really uh, conceptually straightforward way to do that is to measure the flake before you pattern it into a channel and understand, you know, to make it wide enough that the boundaries aren't a big problem. It's true, and it, it's it's not. I mean, you can. It's okay. We go through a lot of uh, effort here, but but you're you're right in that. Look, uh, the Manchester Group makes many of these devices. They've been making them for a long time. They probably don't even need to really measure it uh, on each flake uh, anymore, right? They they have uh, high quality control, right? The, they give us a sample that has nice looking physics. We can probably look up uh, in papers or just ask them what um, what's the mean free path that you expect, right? But we want to be you know rigorous experimentalists and uh, like have our uh, data all self contained within uh, within uh, one set of experiments and not have to rel or rely as minimally as possible on uh, external results. The, uh, the other real reason uh, is that uh, doing a lot of other uh, measurements before patterning it uh, is probably going to degrade the quality of the graphene, right? So uh, you want to do as little as possible before you actually carve it up with, uh, with the etching. If I can just add one thing, is that if you remember the, the topography geometry of the device, it had three channels of different widths. One of them was 11 micron. This is almost about the device. You know? mm -hmm. so we can. We also have this to, to make sure that this measurement makes sense, right? So not the only. Yeah, but 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 the problem. But again, the problem with uh, an 11 micron wide device is that you maybe say, okay, now you have a non-ideal aspect ratio, right? So. Uh, yeah, nothing, no measurement is ideal, but. Uh, yeah. Okay, but but we get values that are you know consistent with uh, with the other experiments from the Manchester group. So, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so the other in important quantity to get is uh, this coefficient p, which is the specularity of the walls. So if uh, p is not close to zero, you won't have this high visibility of the magnetoresistance uh, at all. So we already have strong indication just from trivially looking at this curve that p is about zero. Okay, and uh, why, is this, uh, why is this really important? Well. If, uh, if you don't know P reasonably well, you could guess that, okay, maybe you have P close to 1 at 4 Kelvin, but as you heat the sample, the walls are going to get uh, more diffusive probably. They're certainly not going to get less diffusive as you heat, uh, heat the device, right? So if you have P changing while you heat the device, this is going to change the curvature of the profiles you measure, and this adds a 
huge amount of uncertainty into your experiment, right? Uh, you could say, ah, maybe the change in curvature you see due to heating is because this P changed and not because of electron-electron uh, interactions or something like this. So, uh, so we want to firmly establish that at 4 Kelvin, P is already about zero, and then as we heat, we don't have to worry about it anymore because it's already uh, fully diffusive even at, uh, even at low temperature. Okay, so uh, you can do a bit better by, by noting uh, uh, this result uh, from, uh, from Rukas, uh, from, from the late 80s, in fact, where uh, you, you look at where this magnetoresistance double peak disappears uh, as you decrease the density and uh, increase the disorder. And the magnetoresistance uh, at, uh, at the point where the double peak disappears can be, uh, or rather the mean free path associated with this can be related to P uh, and the width of the channel with this formula. And if you apply this analysis, you again get something, you basically get zero. Okay, so maybe you don't want to trust this. Uh, so we have a, a, third, uh, a third metric, which is now we take some channel that has uh, artificially roughened walls. So, uh, so you can't really see it in the optical image, but if you look uh, in what the, uh, and we also have an AFM image of this as well to show that it's really uh, rough in this section, but, but the uh, lithographic, like the, the file of, uh, or the, the pattern that was used uh, to define this channel looks like this. So you have a, a smooth section here and then this uh, rough sawtooth pattern here. So you can expect that the rough sawtooth pattern is definitely going to have diffusive walls. Uh, and then you can say, uh, you can ask, okay, if we apply a voltage here and uh, see how the potential drops across the device, if the roughness changes uh, uh, as a function of position, then this uh, voltage will drop differently in the different regions in space. So we do this measurement, uh, and you see uh, basically a straight line here. So the uh, highlighted region here is the region away from the contacts. So you look at that region here of the, uh, the voltage drop in space, and you can't, uh, you won't, from looking at this, you won't be able to tell me where the rough region ends and where the smooth, the non-rough, artificially roughened region uh, starts. So uh, from this, we can also say that uh, the walls are, are rough uh, at, uh, at low temperature. Okay, so. Just quickly, uh, what's the scale of the boundary roughness? I think it's at the lithographic limit, so probably 20, 20 nanometers, something like this, 50 nanometers, I think. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so now we have a good handle on the uh, magnetoresistance and the specularity of the walls. Uh, so we'll move on to trying to understand what these uh, ballistic profiles uh, have to do with the current, and uh, or rather, what the uh, EY, how it relates to the uh, the current in the ballistic regime, uh, and. Uh, also, uh, to what extent does the magnetic field uh, change this? Okay, so why is this important? Uh, so I'll plot here just a, a cartoon of the, the current density uh, as a function of position along the channel. Uh, ignoring hydrodynamics completely, this is just going to look at the ballistic to diffusive crossover, okay? So in the ballistic limit where you have LMR much, much greater than W, you expect a ballistic current profile that has some gentle curvature, um, um, not really parabolic, but, uh, but not flat either. Um, in the fully diffusive limit, uh, especially if you have these uh, diffusive walls, as I, as I motivated in the last slides, the current is going to go to zero at the walls, um, and then it's going to be flat in the bulk of the channel, okay? Uh, but now you can ask what's going to happen, how does this gentle curve become this weird shape here, right? So you can, of course, generate this in simulations, but obviously you have a crossover that goes through something that's like a parabola. So you do the most naive measurement, you image uh, Jx and see that it's a parabola, where you're, you can't conclude uh, that this is hydrodynamics, right? You can conclude that uh, maybe I'm just imaging the ballistic to diffusive crossover, right? And of course, in these devices, we're going to be in this limit where LMR is about W. Uh, this is exactly where you expect a reasonably parabolic current profile uh, as a function of, uh, uh, of, uh, of density or, uh, or, or temperature, uh, depending on uh, what, uh, what you're, you're trying to probe uh, particularly. But, um, uh, right, so, so I'll, I'll call this, result, this regime instead the extreme ballistic case. And this is really where LMR is much, much greater than W. But this isn't something that's really physically accessible to us in, in a real device. 
Um, these two regimes are certainly, and this is uh, about as clean as we'll get it in this uh, this so-called ballistic device, where LMR is you know greater than W, but not uh, really uh, much much greater. Um, so instead of looking at JX, uh, we have uh, okay. That's also happens to conveniently be what we actually measure with our technique. We measure EY, right? So that's the, the derivative of the Hall voltage uh, along the, the width of the channel. And we'll see now how, how this can actually help discriminate between the, these different uh, cases. OK, uh, but to, uh, to understand that, you, you need to understand that, um, in general, you shouldn't expect EY and JX to, to be the same, uh, to have the same functional form, right? Even though in the, uh, the diffusive limit, these things are basically equal to each other. And in the ballistic limit, uh, you shouldn't uh, assume this at all. But this may not sound intuitive. So, uh, so let's think about, uh, about the simplest physical model to try to build this intuition. So you can imagine that you have uh, some channel here. And instead of thinking about electrons anymore, you just have ballistic balls that you, uh, that you shoot through a device. Okay, so. This is all we're going to have. There's no other scattering in this device. There's just ballistic balls that uh, can follow straight line trajectories. And uh, when they hit the wall, they'll, they'll uh, reflect off the wall with uh, this fully diffusive uh, scattering, right, which randomizes the angles. Um, so that's what happens at uh, b equals 0. Um, and uh, because of this kind of scattering, you can, you can, you can see that uh, if you find some electron anywhere in the bulk, it's going to be equally likely to be going in any direction. Okay, so we'll say its probability distribution is uh, completely circular. All right. Now we're going to turn on the magnetic field and see what this, how this distribution changes. Okay, so we'll just pick a, a random field here of W over RC uh, equals to two, and we're going to ask: Is JX proportional to EY? And we'll see that it's not. Okay, so let's look at what happens at this uh, this height here, y uh, y zero. And uh, for this picture, we're going to say that the voltage generated by these, uh, the effective voltage generated by these ballistic balls bouncing around is equivalent to the density of the balls that you find at some region in space. So uh, because these, these balls don't have any charge or anything, this is just, that's how you sort of map it onto uh, the physical problem, right? So density of the balls is going to be voltage, all right? So, so you can think about what uh, balls can actually make it to this slice here and why. And those are going to come from a series of cyclotron orbits uh, that, uh, that come from uh, some point uh, along the, uh, the wall uh, here that are emitted at different angles. So the one that's uh, emitted with this uh, grazing angle here will have uh, contribute density of balls uh, at this height y going in this direction here and this direction here. So we'll plot, uh, we have a contribution to the density here and here at this angle. Now we'll change uh, the angle of, uh, of incidence to this, and that will contribute uh, electrons going at uh, this uh, direction and this direction. And it turns out, because of the uh, way the electrons randomize the, the momenta at the walls, that the contribution uh, at uh, this uh, trajectory is exact, or this angle is the same as at this angle, and is in fact constant for, for each angle. So this uh, gives you a uniform distribution of, of angles, although it's uh, uniform only between this, uh, this region theta here. Uh, beyond that, it's zero. So if you find some uh, elect electron uh, at this height here in magnetic field, you can say it's equally probable to be in any angle between, uh, between plus and minus theta. Okay? And again, because the density of balls is equivalent to their voltage, the, uh, the uh, potential here is just 2 theta of y. And so at different, uh, different y's, you'll get different uh, uh, coverage of this uh, circle. So for uh, y very close to the wall, it's again completely, uh, you have the uh, complete uniform probability again, which uh, was sort of the boundary condition that we started with. And uh, it will decrease uh, going up uh, like this. OK, so this allows you to say that ey is going to be like the derivative of this, uh, of this angle with respect to y. And Jx is going to be the component along the uh, direction of the channel uh, times the distribution, right? So this is just going to be cosine theta d theta, uh, which trivially is just sine theta. So in this very simple, you know, most basic model, Ey is like the derivative of this angle, and Jx is the sine of the angle, right? There's no reason that these things are the same at all. It's just uh, 
completely different. So in the ballistic regime, EY and JX are, are completely, uh, I wouldn't say unrelated, right? They're, they're related in, in this way, but they're, they're not equal to each other. They have some non-trivial mathematical relationship, right? Um, but again, as, as we discussed in the last talk, because of the, uh, the restoration of the locality between, uh, due to electron-electron uh, interactions in the hydrodynamic regime, EY and JX again become the same. So now we see that uh, actually in, uh, in the ballistic regime, EY doesn't really represent the current. It represents uh, e itself. It, it's just EY, right? And, but in the hydrodynamic regime, if you measure EY, you can really measure JX. So what we're going to do now is uh, show measurements of EY and then say, show how they're different in both the ballistic and the hydrodynamic regime. And then say, because we are in the hydrodynamic regime, this EY is actually JX. Can I ask a question here? Because um, I, I don't doubt what you're saying for a minute, but you're implying that a characteristic of hydrodynamics is a local relationship between field and, and current. Yeah. And yet a lot of whatever else we've been hearing is that that is not the characteristic of a hydrodynamic regime. So why does it work in this case? Uh, it's almost. Uh, there is a small deviation which is proportional to the Knudsen number squared. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can say that. If you have a number of 0.1, it's going to be 1% okay, really. deviation. That's I'm really asking for clarification because yeah. we've heard many other yeah. contrary statements. So, so the, the theory for this is, um, is based on the, the Boltzmann equation uh, for the relevant parameters of this, uh, you know, the, uh, the relevant mean free path, for example. Uh, you're, you're basing this on the findings of kinetic calculation. Yes, yes. Yes, good. Perfect. Uh, and and we'll, we'll see that it, it agrees, right? So, as I say, I'm not doubting you. I just want to. No, you can doubt. It's okay. It's okay. It's reasonable. But um, okay. So uh, so now let's uh, go back to uh, an actual uh, device. So it's this uh, five micron channel now, and we're going to be. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, we'll be in the um, ballistic regime here. So LMR over W is 1.4. Of course, we could, in principle, tune this to be more favorable, but we, again, want to be able to directly compare to, uh, to high temperature profiles. So we'll choose something that is you know, what we're calling ballistic, but, uh, but keep in mind this is the actual, uh, the actual value, right? So there still is uh, some bulk uh, scattering involved. Um, OK, and we see uh, in the experiment, this is what the Hall voltage profile looks like. It has this sort of S-like uh, shape, and this is done at a few different uh, magnetic field values. And uh, this agrees uh, very nicely with this simulation. Uh, so this relates to what you asked. Uh, uh, this, uh, this simulation is based on the Boltzmann equation, uh, right? For, uh, for no uh, momentum, for LMC uh, infinite, and just for uh, the, this uh, value of LMR over W. OK. Um, you might not get much uh, appreciation for this uh, curve uh, presented like this. Uh, one other caveat, though, I want to say is that uh, I don't want to have to rely on measurements close to the walls at all uh, for our scanning technique. Uh, you can guess that, by definition, the signals are going to go to zero uh, when you go to the wall anyway, right? So this isn't going to be super helpful. Uh, if you can make a very strong claim that your spatial resolution is much, much less than the, the width of the channel, then you can get uh, closer and closer. But uh, we're trying to be very conservative, so we're going to block out about 40% of the channel, in fact, and not have to rely on, uh, on what's going on uh, near the walls at all. So that's why I grayed out the region here. And in a lot of the plots, you'll see these bars here, which shows you that the, the analysis we do is, is focusing on the, on the center here. Of course, we still measure at the walls. We're just not going to rely on uh, what's going on there. OK, but again, because you, you don't see much going on here, we'll take the derivative uh, of this. And you see uh, really unexpected, uh, unexpected behavior. So again, the, the experiment here on the left matches really well with the theory. And these are this, this is this EY uh, measured at different magnetic fields. What temperature here is it? 4 Kelvin? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so these are pretty exotic looking shapes. And even though I just told you that EY isn't the same as JX, they're, they're they, they have uh, some relation in the sense that uh, the blue curve here is Jx uh, at uh, W over RC of 3.5. Uh, so you see the, the current actually is much less at the walls and uh, is, is greater uh, on average uh, near the center of the channel. I think this is not something that's intuitive to, to most people, 
Uh, so it's a, it's a bit of a diversion for this. I can talk about it at the end if there's, if there's some interest. But uh, for now, we'll, we'll move on. And uh, yeah. So this is the same sample with different magnetic fields? Yes, this is this sample. No, no, this is this, is this sample fixed width. All we do is ch change the magnetic field. Yeah. And um, OK, so we see that there's some exotic stuff happening at these uh, larger field values. So let's go away from that and just stick to uh, W over RC of 1.6, okay? So, and we'll, we'll ask uh, again later, is this even low enough? Uh, maybe this is a pretty arbitrary choice. We'll see that it's not. Uh, actually, the, the conclusions aren't going to rely on, on this particular uh, magnetic field. Okay. Sorry? You show us one cut along the Yeah. Same. We'll see in a second. Yeah. The answer is yes, though. It's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. We, we can also do two-dimensional uh, plots. It's just easier for, to compare against the, the other curves to show uh, line cuts. Yeah. OK, so the, uh, again, this, uh, this is actual. Now this isn't a cartoon. This is the, the Boltzmann uh, simulation or theory. Uh, now, uh, and this is with LMC over W uh, equal to infinity, so no electron-electron interactions. So this shows you with this uh, LMR over W, uh, so this amount of uh, disorder, and this magnetic field, this is what Jx looks like through the, through the device. So this looks like a nice parabola, right? Uh, so if you image current, you will see this parabola, and you say, yeah, this is uh, hydrodynamics, this is wrong conclusion, because there's no hydrodynamics here. Um, however, if you now, uh, oh, so I, I should stress that <coughs> Ey, on the other hand, is, is pretty flat, at least in the center of the channel. Around the boundaries, it does something weird. But again, we're not going to rely on what's going on near the boundaries anyway. We're going to look at the, the bulk of the channel here. So ballistic flat, uh, ballistic EY flat, uh, ballistic JX para parabola. Uh, in the hydrodynamic regime, so now we tune uh, LMC over W to be 0 0.14 in the simulation. Uh, or uh, We'll see why we picked this number in a second. Um, but now you see that uh, JX, again, is parabolic, maybe not with the exact same numbers, maybe not going to the edge, uh, you know, going down to the exact same value at the edge of the channel, but still it's a parabola, right? So there isn't like a dramatic difference between these uh, JX profiles. Whereas the, the hydrodynamic profile, uh, sorry, the, uh, the EY profile of, in the hydrodynamic and ballistic regime uh, are really different looking, right? This is a straight line, more or less. This is a parabola. Okay, so... Uh, so right, so in the hydrodynamic regime, we can then, you see, you know, actually with the, with the simulation that EY and JX are, are being restored. Um, okay, so now we're ready to, uh, to heat into the hydrodynamic regime and, uh, and see if uh, we actually observe in experiment what, what we can expect. Um, okay, so, so this is, the, again, the theory for EY, because that's, again, what we, what we actually measure. Uh, and we'll look uh, first at 4 Kelvin. So again, these are the parameters. LMR over W is 1.4, and we're at this, this particular value of magnetic field, uh, W over RC equals 1.6. And uh, the EY looks pretty flat in the, uh, in the channel. You can say, okay, the different, the, you know, again, by definition, our uh, signal is going to go to zero at the edge of the channel. So we'll ignore this section here where it starts dropping uh, rapidly, but, but for this part of the channel, uh, the point spread function of our, of our detector is much, much uh, less than uh, the size of this region. So there's, you can confidently trust that this is the real signal uh, for, for at least this region. Okay, so it uh, matches uh, the theory nicely uh, for here. So now we'll, we'll uh, take advantage of, of this uh, aspect that we can lump together the impurity and the phonon contributions to LMR uh, with this, uh, this simple relation. Um, Matisse's rule, uh, however you pronounce it. Um, um, and so at, uh, at low temperature, this contribution isn't relevant, uh, but we have some L impurities due to the particular density we choose. So now when we go to higher temperature, we will increase the density to reduce this term while this term uh, increases uh, correspondingly. So when you uh, keep the, uh, the mean free path exactly the same uh, at 4 Kelvin and 75 Kelvin, uh, to the extent that we can claim they're the same, you see that EY, which was uh, flat at 4 Kelvin, is now nicely parabolic. Okay, so this is what we're going to call Pussy electron flow, because we have this parabolic profile. And we showed, uh, theoretically, that uh, EY and JX in this regime, where, it's, where EY is parabolic, 
EY and JX uh, are directly proportional again. And this corresponds to, uh, you know, so we, we tune LMC over W in the simulation until we get uh, a curvature that matches what we see here uh, in the, the center of the channel. And this corresponds to a, a Knudsen number of about 0 0.15 or an LMC of about one micron. And this is pretty consistent with uh, the Manchester group's uh, result as well. So for, for example, if you look in uh, uh, Roshan's paper in Nature Physics with the super ballistic flow, uh, I, I think this, this number is, uh, is totally consistent at, at, at 75 Kelvin. Okay. Um, we don't just have to look at line cuts, uh, as you asked. Uh, we can do the measurement, uh, you know, over a, a different uh, range of, uh, of uh, expositions uh, and look at the 2D map. I, I showed this uh, last time. Um, so we see that uh, indeed the, uh, the two-dimensional map looks just like the, uh, the 1D uh, line cuts taken at a particular value. You see that uh, in the center of the channel, the ballistic uh, regime is flat and at 75 Kelvin, it's uh, curved. So we can, uh, we can actually plot here the axis instead of just using arbitrary units uh, for EY because people don't have good intuition for thinking about EY anyway. There's no point in normalizing this to the physical unit. But in the, in the hydrodynamic regime, we can really put uh, this in terms of current density. So this corresponds to about uh, 20 microamps through the, through the uh, device. Uh, and we see that uh, it's insensitive to the, the current, right? If we try to push more current through it or, or less, uh, you know, less the, the signal will get a bit noisier, but uh, so, you know, we, uh, we're not uh, doing anything due to electron heating. And the same here, the, uh, the result, uh, well, this is measured at, at less current because uh, if you put, uh, you know, so, so this is measured at around uh, 10 microamps, I, I think, and uh, if you push more current through it than that, you'll also increase the curvature due to uh, electron, uh, you know, the current heating, the, similar to what uh, Lawrence uh, discussed uh, yesterday. Um, okay. But again, this was done at a very specific value of magnetic field. So, you know, you should be critical and ask, uh, maybe this is a complete artifact of uh, this magnetic field. Uh, who knows what happens as a function of magnetic field? Or at least this result is super dependent on magnetic field. I showed you that these uh, EY profiles had these exotic shapes as a function of magnetic field. So why are we ignoring this now? Uh, so we're going to define a quantity now uh, we call the curvature. Uh, and we do this by um, sampling the uh, electric field uh, very, uh, very carefully at a fixed set of positions here. So instead of measuring a nice smooth curve, we'll say choose eight points, which will nicely define a parabola. Uh, and now uh, fit here and using the coefficients uh, define the curvature. So we'll, we'll uh, now uh, try to compare how this curvature uh, kappa changes as a function of magnetic field. Okay, so uh, this is the experiment for three different temperatures. You see the, the curvature has a pretty strong dependence, right? But keep in mind that the uh, experiments I just showed were at, uh, at uh, 1.6. So we actually see in this regime here, where W over RC is less than two, the curvature at each temperature is really independent of temperature. Uh, right? Sorry, independent of magnetic field. Yeah, sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, so at uh, four Kelvin, it's fluctuating around zero, as you, as you saw that the, uh, these ballistic curves, uh, ballistic profiles uh, looked flat. And at, uh, at 75 Kelvin, this kappa is, is around two. Um, you can ask, how does this uh, compare with the, this uh, Boltzmann model again? So this is, uh, again, a Boltzmann calculation uh, for these exact uh, parameters, uh, where we vary W uh, uh, LMC uh, over LMR uh, at the different temperatures. Uh, and you see that, uh, again, kappa is, uh, is constant for W over RC less than two. So uh, in the regime where we measure, uh, we think that this curvature, oh, okay, and the other important point is that it's, it's constant down to, down to zero, right? Uh, of course, at actually zero, it's very hard for us to measure, but uh, the theory is uh, giving uh, the exact same thing we see in the experiment, that it's uh, independent of this magnetic field. So, so I, I think you can trust that, uh, that this curvature isn't some artifact of uh, the measurement technique in that regard. Would the expansion depend on field eventually? Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, of course. Uh, and this is exactly what we see in the experiment, right? Uh, this, so this region here corresponds to these more exotic profiles, uh, which I, I, I can discuss at the end if there's a bit of time. Uh, um, yeah, okay. Um, so that's just one uh, crucial parameter. The other was that uh, 
we were at a uh, particular value of LMR, and, uh, and maybe we misestimated LMR, or you can't trust that we had the same LMR at 4 Kelvin versus 75 Kelvin, right? Uh, and we showed already that the profiles can have a really strong dependence on LMR in principle. Um, okay, at, uh, at 4 Kelvin, I'll remind you that uh, LMR looks like this. Uh, at 75 Kelvin, it uh, flattens out uh, at, uh, at higher density. And this is just because uh, in this regime, uh, you're limited by phonons, right? So decreasing the density further uh, isn't going to improve the, uh, the LMR because uh, uh, the phonon contribution is, uh, is dominating. Um, but you see, uh, we can actually sort of use this to our advantage because LMR is constant in this regime. We can choose uh, sort of two points uh, at the extreme of this value, uh, of this uh, flat region, uh, the, the highest density we measure and uh, before it starts uh, curving down due to changing the, uh, the impurity scattering, uh, and ask, uh, okay, so, so if you compare the actual LMR curves, uh, they you know, overlap uh, very nicely. Uh, so this just sort of, uh, so, sorry, the, uh, the magneto resistance curves uh, overlap uh, very nicely between these, these two points uh, to show you they really do have the, the same LMR. Um, and we can now uh, plot the, the profiles taken at uh, this density and this density, and you see that the, uh, the, uh, the curvature changes uh, quite a lot. So at, uh, at uh, this density, it's uh, 1.1, and at this density, it's, uh, it's 2. Uh, the, the dashed line here is the, uh, the fit to the, the uh, parabola at the, uh, or a parabolic fit to the EY at the, at the center of the channel. Uh, so we can do this now as, uh, as a function of density for both the 75K and 4, 4K data. And we see that, first of all, at 75 Kelvin, the curvature you know, gently goes up as you lower the density. And this is expected, right? Uh, uh, the, uh, the LEE should uh, decrease with uh, 1 over the square root of the density, I, I think, uh, in, the, in the hydrodynamic regime. Uh, so uh, you expect this increase. But if we've misestimated, uh, LMR uh, it doesn't matter, right? Because the 75 uh, Kelvin curvature is greater than the uh, 4 Kelvin uh, ballistic curvature for a huge range of densities. Okay, so uh, the, the fact that we were trying to compare directly between uh, two exact uh, uh, mean free paths can be relaxed a bit. This, this constraint can be relaxed now that we see uh, the curvature isn't really uh, going to show something. Uh, there's no crossovers happening between this. Of course, when you get to uh, close to charge neutrality, it becomes more complicated again in this uh, electron uh, hole uh, uh, fluid regime. So uh, we're not going to make any claims about what's going on here. But uh, for this, uh, this regime here, where you have nicely ballistic transport at 4 Kelvin and uh, uh, at, at 75 Kelvin, uh, this looks uh, hydrodynamic and is, uh, is matched really well by the, the Boltzmann calculations. OK, so uh, to sum up, uh, we saw that uh, we can image nicely these, uh, these EY profiles and that uh, in the hydrodynamic regime, EY is actually uh, going to give you the, the current density. So we can claim that this uh, two-dimensional plot here is actually a two-dimensional map of, uh, of Poissy electron flow in, uh, in a graphene device. Uh, and we also showed that this result is not strongly dependent on uh, the magnetic field that we are required to use by our technique, at least for the, this uh, range of fields here where, where this data is taken. And uh, as well, the, uh, the issue of uh, comparing the mean free path uh, between 4 Kelvin and 75 Kelvin isn't super important either because we, we see that the result is robust over a, a series of densities. Uh, so uh, just to describe a, a bit about uh, future work, uh, you know, I, I discussed uh, last time uh, that it's pretty hard to see uh, hydrodynamic voltage patterns that aren't uh, really due to underlying ballistic uh, effects. But you can still try to do these measurements. We're still uh, pushing forward with them because there's a lot of interesting things to see. So just to give a, a hint of uh, something you can think about as uh, uh, there's uh, nice predictions by, by Falkovich's group, for example, with uh, looking at uh, the Corbino geometry and how the potential drops uh, in real space in the ballistic versus diffusive versus uh, hydrodynamic regime. So these voltage signatures are, uh, should have uh, interesting uh, predictions that's very different between the ballistic and the, uh, and the hydrodynamic regime. So that's something uh, nice to look at. We also uh, get for free in these measurements 
the, uh, the hull viscosity uh, kind of measurements effectively because uh, we're measuring uh, the uh, hull voltage at every point in space here. Now you can just take the two points on the edge, right? And uh, the difference between those uh, will give you the, the hull resistance, right? And we do it in a contact free way, so we don't have to think about uh, influence of, uh, of the shape of the contacts uh, causing some spurious effects in the data. So uh, this is our experiment uh, at a series of temperatures, uh, and we can compare this again with, uh, with theory. Uh, and you see that uh, there's a quite nice agreement, and we, we think we observe the deviations from the classical uh, Hall effect that are in the uh, ballistic regime due to uh, uh, ballistic effects, this sort of uh, 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 zeroth plateau kind of physics. Uh, and the, uh, at, at higher temperatures, the deviation uh, can be attributed to hydrodynamic physics. Uh, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll conclude. Yeah, uh, it's a, a sharp question. Uh, you <laughs> you noticed the the scale. Uh, it's good, uh, right? So, so this is due to uh, a couple of effects. So, basically, uh, we don't have an infinite channel. Okay, so uh, we also it's matched by simulations as well. When you have a, a non-infinite channel, uh, the e y can be actually negatively shaped, uh, negatively curved in the, in the ballistic regime. And the crossover from negative to positive is going to happen when uh, RC is going to cross the, si the length of the channel. Okay, So now at higher fields, RC is uh, smaller than the length of the channel, and it's effectively infinite in that regard. And the other jump in, uh, in the curvature is, uh, I think, due to RC becoming less than the width of the channel. So that's uh, what? Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, L. No, no, the, this, uh, this one. Yeah, OK, whatever. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the, the reason it's, uh, it's negative. Uh. But if I want to reconcile the two curves, because you see the region in 75, you have a curve of two, curvature is two. Mm -hmm. So the, the other guys are at what temperature? Uh, four Kelvin. OK. Yeah. So we are not discussing the change in the ballistic profile in Canada. Is that correct? Is it? Is it? Yeah, blue is ballistic, red is uh, hydrodynamic. Or rather, blue is 4 Kelvin, red is 75 Kelvin. Yeah. But then, why this guy never becomes two like the one I... Why does this never become two? You see, the, at the, the left one... Yeah. Wait, the, the, this, this? You have two at some point. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's because here we're varying the density at a fixed magnetic field, right? And this is a varying magnetic field. So the magnetic field, even with nothing to do with hydrodynamics, will have a huge influence on the curvature. Uh, OK, so I'll just uh, I'll t I'll give you the, the short story why, OK? So this is the data I showed uh, earlier. And I said this was sort of this diversion uh, unrelated that at, at larger magnetic fields, you get these weird EY profiles. And what's going on? OK, so let's, let's pick W of RC equals 3. So you can consider these skipping orbits, uh, electrons on one side, uh, holes on the other side of the channel going the opposite direction. Uh, this is what these skipping orbits look like for W over RC equals 3. But let's, uh, let's think about the, the orbits that actually will uh, overlap uh, in the bulk, uh, right? that aren't uh, these uh, skipping orbits. So the, the extremal orbit here that uh, will just close in on itself and make a full rotation of the electrons looks like this. The hole looks like this. And they're overlapping in the center like this. And so if you think about how these uh, overlap, this is giving you this uh, contribution to the EY that's following the shape of where they're overlapping. So this, this hump here is associated with these uh, orbits overlapping uh, here. But and not you, to the current. Not to the current, uh, EY. The current uh, looks like this, this uh -huh. blue thing here, right? They're related. They're, they're roughly the same, right, in the sense that they're both higher on average in the middle than they are at the edges, right? But there are particular dips and peaks that uh, change between them. Uh, and then at W of RC equals 4, for example, you have uh, them just meeting in the center. And that's why you have this cusp thing. The peak is uh, here. So instead of having this larger overlapping region where you have uh, this wider uh, bulbous shape here, you have this uh, more cuspy thing here where they just meet in the center. And then at higher fields where they no longer overlap, you get this uh, flat region in the center. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's the 
the uh, intuition for uh, what's going on. So that's, uh, that's what's happening uh, here for the ballistic curve above, uh, above W over RC equals 2. Uh, so experimentally, at time that values of W over RC, you see something which is more curved at low temperature. Is that correct? Uh, yes, at, at high values of W over C. And yeah. The simulation reproduces that it happens at W over R C of order of three. That's uh, yeah. That's a uh, that's a good question. Um, we don't get a really great uh, um, match between the simulations and the curvature for these larger values yet at high temperature. Uh, so this is something that uh, needs to be worked out. Uh, but for low temperature, it uh, matches nicely. Uh, yeah, and and at low field, it matches nicely. Right, so the, the region that's relevant to the hydrodynamic story, everything matches nicely. Um, yeah. Okay. Questions? Let's uh, thank Joe again.